Hey crew, before we get started today, I wanted to let you know that our live episode from Convergence 2017 is now available on our Patreon page. Head to patreon.com forward slash E-I-S-T. P-O-D. There you can find our live show, where I and a panel of special guests discuss Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. And coming soon to our Patreon page, our ongoing series of mini-episodes for our Deep Space Nine rewatch, where I'll be providing commentary and analysis on DS9, and oh my god, there's more! Patrons will have access to my production diary for Klingon Christmas Carol, which I'll be directing this December at the historic Mounds Theater in St. Paul. All of this is available to our patrons, our crew members, and you can become one by going to patreon.com forward slash EIST pod. Join today for as little as $1 and get access to our great subscriber content, rewards, and much, much more. One more time, it's patreon.com forward slash EIST pod. Enlist today. Coming up directly, we're talking to John Jackson Miller about Rightful Air, but I wanted to warn you, the sound quality for bits of the episode aren't quite up to Starfleet subspace radio standards. It's not too bad, but we just wanted to acknowledge the problem. It's the result of some computer issues that should be fixed now. And incidentally, one of our Patreon goals is to get some upgraded equipment to make recording episodes a little more streamlined in the future. So keep that in mind if you decide to subscribe. Anyway, it's a great episode. I had a lot of fun talking to John, so enjoy the show. Check out his books and his websites, and don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter at EIST Pod. And with that, let's get underway. It's worked so far, but we're not out yet. I want to know what you're thinking. There are some things you can't hide. I want to know what you're feeling. Tell me what's on your mind. Hailing Frequencies Open, and welcome to Enterprising Individuals, the Star Trek discussion podcast that boldly goes into excruciating detail about the series, characters, and stories of the Star Trek universe. I'm your host, Caliban, and I would never ask the Almighty for his ID, but I wouldn't mind if he picked up a check once in a while. I'm joined on this episode by John Jackson Miller, the New York Times bestselling author of Kenobi, a Star Wars novel, as well as A New Dawn, the first Star Wars novel created in conjunction with the Lucasfilm Story Group. He's also the writer of 10 volumes of the Dark Horse Comics Knights of the Old Republic series and its follow-up Star Wars Knight Errant. His Star Trek work includes the Next Generation novel Takedown and the Star Trek Prey trilogy of novels. He was a former editor for Comics Buyer's Guide and its sister publications Comics and Games Retailer and Scry. And he's a commentator on comic book circulation history at his website, Comicron.com. John, welcome to the show. Hey, glad to be here. Permission to come aboard granted. Today we'll be talking about Rightful Air, the 23rd episode of the sixth season of Star Trek The Next Generation. It's a Klingon episode. It's possibly the most important Klingon episode of Next Gen because it pits the Klingons' deep-seated spiritual and cultural beliefs against their society's fragile and contentious power structure. And we've talked about religion on this show before when we covered Who Mourns for Adonais. But Rightful Air transplants the conspicuous self-inspection of that episode from humanity to the Klingons, as Worf contemplates the seeming truths of his people's oldest myths. But we will get to that a little later in the show. Right now, I want to know, what's your backstory? How did you become a Star Trek fan? Uh, Well, I certainly, you know, was born a little bit too late to watch the uh, episodes when they came out. Uh, You know, fun thing is uh, the night that I was born was the night that they first aired the uh, episode, A Piece of the Action. Uh, Okay, sure. (laughs) That was uh, that was the one where uh, they, you know, go to the uh, planet where it's all sets from uh, the Untouchables, which is you know on the other on the other half of the Desilu lot, and so uh, you know I what I probably first saw Star Trek was the anime series uh, oh, yeah. on, on Saturday mornings, and uh, yeah, then I would see the uh, you know the local channel would have the uh, the reruns uh, on Saturday afternoons. Uh, Star Wars hit in uh, 1977, and uh, yeah, that kind of took over my life for the next few years certainly uh you know, was seeing uh the other star trek stuff that was out there uh, particularly when the yeah you know, the movies came around yeah. uh you know i i had seen uh the second and third movies uh both on cable uh and you know particularly star trek 3 uh, yeah, I may be the one person who's more fond of three than than two, even though I understand. Okay. <laughs> even though even though I understand that two is a better movie uh, yeah. and a better Star Trek movie, 
uh, just some of the, the themes that are in three, uh, you know, resonated with me, which is obvious because I ended up spending a lot of time on, on Krug in the, uh, in the Prey trilogy. Uh, but, uh, you know, once Star Wars goes away uh, after Return of the Jedi, you know, for almost, you know, eight or nine years where there's very little new material coming out. Uh, yeah. And the presumption, even by George Lucas, you know, the presumption was that that you know, he was done. Uh, yeah. You know, they, uh, you know, that that's when uh, you know I got more into uh, the movies. Trek Four came out, and then we had Next Generation, and that gave me the chance to watch a series from the beginning. Uh, yeah. And I think, like most everybody else, uh, until that series. You know, as they say on uh, on TV tropes, uh, until that series grows grows the beard, uh, <laughs> and 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 we get into those later episodes. Uh, yeah, really, kind of the I think the 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 episode where I just sort of said, okay, yeah, we're we're cooking here. Um, is is not even uh, not even you know the, the uh, you know the introduction of the Borg or anything like that, which I'm sure a lot of other people would say. Uh, right. You know, it was for me uh, when uh, we got a look at Kronos uh, in in uh, the uh, Sins of the Father episode, uh, right. and we were able to start developing this entire backstory uh, around the Klingon Empire that made them more than simply you know the the uh, villain of the week that showed up every so often. Uh, you know, obviously the the characters had always had a culture. Uh, that had been developed in the fiction and in, in various other places. But I, I really think that that was the moment where I think Next Generation starts to run with it. Uh, and, you know, we get into the Klingon Civil War uh, arc, uh, which, you know, is, you know, following uh, following us along. And, and that was, uh, that was uh, you know, in, in, the, in the 90s. Uh, or takes us into the '90s anyway, and uh, right. you know, and I think Rightful Air is is probably the pinnacle of uh, the Klingon episodes of Next Gen uh, in yeah. terms of you know what's important about it. As, as for me, when that episode came out, uh, which was May of '93, uh, that was in a transition period for me. I was uh, I had you know, always done fan magazines and things like that. Uh, was uh, you know the editor of my high school newspaper, my college newspaper. Okay. I had just graduated from uh, a grad school where I got what I consider to be a useless master's degree in Soviet studies. Um, <laughs> okay. I, I apologize to the people that have heard this joke a hundred times from me, but the the Soviet Union literally collapsed on my dissertation. Uh, I, right. <laughs> I, I, Good work. <laughs> I, I, I was not able to, I was not able to really go for the doctorate because everything I was studying was gone. Uh, so <laughs> I, at this episode came out, I, I had taken my first job, uh, in, uh, in a magazine company and I was just about to jump from there, uh, to the company that publishes comics buyer's guide. Uh, right. and of course that's where I was, uh, for the next 13 years, uh, I was the editor of the trade magazine uh, for the comics business. I still run a comics website or a comics history website called Comicron, uh, which has all the sales figures for all the comic books. You know, somewhere along the way in there, uh, I got a chance to pitch for Marvel um, and mm -hmm. drawing upon – uh, drawing upon the Soviet thing, uh, what I pitched was the, uh, uh, the a series called Crimson Dynamo, which was about the the Russian version of Iron Man. Right, right. And uh, and that led to me getting to write for Iron Man, and that led to me getting to write for Star Wars, and uh, you know, Star Wars, uh, you know, led to me getting to uh, to write for Star Trek. Uh, right. Although interestingly, I actually pitched a Star Trek pro story. Before I did any Star Star Wars uh, fiction, uh, okay, uh, I had I had done a a story for uh, or a pitch rather for uh, the Starfleet Corps of Engineers series, sure, and it was accepted by uh, Keith DeCandido who who ran the. Ran the line, but they, yeah. they ended up canceling the line before they got to my story. So I just re <laughs> I, I recycled it and I used it in a, a Lost Tribe of the Sith story. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> uh, well, let's back up just a little bit. Uh, you mentioned uh, high school before. I think the really important question is, what's Chris Hardwick like in real life? Uh, Chris uh, was about three years younger than me. Uh, we So 
uh, you know, I knew him in uh, I, I knew him in middle school and when when he was in middle school and I was in high school and then I knew him in high uh, high school because I was his um, I was his senior. Uh, well, we back back in the day we had uh, we had hazings. Uh, so, OK, sure. <laughs> so uh, so during freshman initiation week, I was Chris's senior. Uh, and okay. <laughs> so, you know, he was basically supposed to haul, uh, haul my books around and, you know, they did, right. they did all these, you were sponsoring him. Sure. Well, they sure. did all these things that you know, were calculated at the time to you know, humiliate the students. So, you know, I mean, <laughs> no. I mean, I could say that I, I made Chris wear a dress and it's true. Uh, but, <laughs> but, the, but the fact is I, I really hated, uh, the, the whole, uh, the whole thing I hated, I, cause when I had done it, my senior was not a pleasant person, uh, no. and, and so uh, I cut him loose after like a day, and he <laughs> was having so much fun with dressing up and everything that he still did the whole thing for the entire time. Um, <laughs> okay. But yeah, no, I, I knew I knew I knew him. Uh, yeah, I didn't know him well, but uh, sure. we were both in. It's kind of sad. Our our high school was so small we could barely field a football team, but we were the top chess power in the state. Oh yeah, <laughs> and so uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. He and I both realized that we could escape the lunchroom uh, by hanging out in the chess club at lunch, and so uh, and and I think both of us were players where we kind of had no intention of ever learning any strategies. So <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So uh, you know, we we would uh, we would just play each other as opposed to you know the other the other uh, the other kids that were really grinds at it. Anyway, right. uh, I saw I saw him at a, a convention here a few years ago, and you know he was able to sign sign something to me, uh, you know, you know, sign to uh, to his uh, to his uh, you know freshman advisor. So that was kind of fun. <laughs> that's that's cool. Uh, speaking of Star Wars, and this might be the wrong show for that, but uh, many fans, myself included, got perilously close to the dark side emotionally when Lucasfilm relegated all the pre existing Star Wars EU content, including Knights of the Old Republic, to legendary status. That is you know beta level canon but recently the tv show rebels may have taken steps to bringing kotor back into canon by obliquely mentioning the mandalorian war um any comment on that can you see marvel and disney reviving kotor as a property in the new continuity well anything's possible and of course what what they would say is it's not the new continuity it's always been the canon it's always been and this. it's always right, been right. this and you know the eu was was always sort of it was there to be drawn from the same way that it still is there to be drawn from uh, yes. and, you know, but, but always the idea was that if George was going to go his own way, he was going to go his own way. Uh, and, yeah, right, and he wasn't right. going to be you know, beholden to anything, uh, which is you know, quite right because, you know, he, he created, it's his, uh, you know, now of course it's Disney's and they need to do these, these, uh, these new things. Um, you know, I, I think as far as the Mandalorian, the mention of the Mandalorian wars, well, who doesn't think that the Mandalorians didn't have a lot of wars, uh, right. Which one? So, right. <laughs> you know, that would be yeah. my first response would be which one. Uh, the second thing is uh, and I you know, when I wrote the New Dawn novel, which was the first novel in this sort of Lucasfilm story group era, um, you know, uh, in 2014, uh, you know, uh, it was it was one of the things I was telling people. It, it, look, it, all this old stuff is there to be drawn upon and get inspirations from. You know, the planet names are still going to come up. The species names are still going to come up. Some elements are still going to come up. Don't get trapped, though, into playing the parlor game of, oh, 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 because we met, they mentioned the Mandalorian Wars. That means that Mandalore the Ultimate existed, which means that everything that happened here and here and here, that, <laughs> right, that right. way lies madness. Um, yeah, right. You know, I, the, the way I look at it, I mean – yeah, you know, I don't know about Knights of the Old Republic, the uh, you know the video game, but certainly Knights of the Old Republic, the comic book, that yeah. could take place in the Clone Wars. Uh, that could be that could take place at any other time, and you know, so they may be able to do this without having to uh, you know deal with all the rest of the baggage. Uh, and <laughs> because yeah. honestly, there was a lot of stuff in there that you know was complicated and because it had been you know it wasn't necessarily planned out at the start the mandalorians were both a species and a movement the sith were were right just like the The sith Sith were both a species and a movement (laughs) some of that stuff you know i we we had to kind of work around for so many years uh and so that is uh that is something that 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 is you know if they have the opportunity to not mess with that anymore i i certainly think it's a good idea again i i'm speaking with absolutely no knowledge about what they're doing in the future or or even in the present 
Uh, sure. But, you know, they, they have that option. Uh, you were an editor for Comics Buyer's Guide and Scry, and I read your history uh, slash obituary, I guess, on Comicron.com uh, when they closed down. And it was fascinating, but it was a little sad, too. It was a little sad to see uh, that go after so oh, many yeah, years. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, in fact, I just had uh, lunch with Maggie Thompson yesterday. Uh, and, of oh, course, yeah. she's you know, the Martha Washington of comics fandom. Uh, and you know, getting to come up and work with her and Don Thompson for the you know, last year of his life uh, was uh, a great honor, uh, and you know, it really kind of hit me. As, you know, I, I got my dream job in my twenties, uh, you know, working uh, in comics. It certainly beat writing about lumber, which I'd been doing before that. Uh, but <laughs> okay, but then sure. then you know, getting to write comics, uh, you know, Iron Man was you know, one of my one of my favorite comic series. Getting to write that right off the top, and then Star Wars. Well, so and and then getting to write novels, I I've had to keep coming up with new dream jobs. <laughs> <'cause>, <laughs> as, sure, you, you keep accomplishing. Well, and yes. and, and you know, <laughs> obviously, there's a lot of work involved, but uh, but yeah. no, I mean, Comics Buyer's Guide, uh, you know, I it, it's one of those things where uh, you know people of a certain age won't even know you know that magazines about comics really existed. Uh, I mean, Wizard's yeah. been gone for what six years, seven years now. I mean, it's been it's been a while. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. it's hard to imagine. Uh, you know, a t- there was a time where we couldn't have imagined the world without them. Uh, and sure. and so, uh, but it also kind of puts things into perspective. Uh, <laughs> all yeah, all oh, those yeah. all those all those deadlines. You know, the weekly deadlines on Comics Buyer's Guide that we uh, you know, were were having to. Uh, contend with uh and every magazine <laughs> feeling like it was so important uh at, at the time and you know that magazine as my article says it doesn't even exist digitally anywhere uh because we didn't have yeah. the rights uh to anything so uh you know mm-hmm. one mm-hmm. of the things that I am doing though with Comicron uh and uh, that's where I just you know reposted that article uh a couple of days ago uh about the history of the magazine uh, I am working with Maggie uh, and and some other you know folks to try to get some of the things that we do have the rights to and get them back online. Well, well that was a lot of fun non Star oh, yeah. Trek talk. But let's uh, let's talk about Star Trek. Uh, we are talking about the Next Generation episode, Rightful Heir. As I said, it is the 23rd episode of the sixth season. First aired, as you said, in May, uh, May 17th of 1993. The teleplay is by Ronald D. Moore, who needs no introduction to a Star Trek fan. And the story is by James E. Brooks. And funny story, this is literally his only writing credit that I could find. You go to IMDb, you search for James E. Brooks, wow. this is it. Uh, it's like he, he appeared like wow. Keyless and handed the script to Ron D. Moore in despair. Well, and, and that's interesting. And doesn't it doesn't it feel like... A, a a story that a first time writer would pitch uh, to to it a does. series where you take an ancillary character uh, who's only been mentioned a few times uh, and yes. uh, you build a bottle episode around him. Uh, and right, yes, right. You know, one of the things that you'll note about the the episode uh, is uh, well, first of all, I gotta say, if, if he didn't do any more, and, and maybe this is maybe this is the uh, you know the the scripter. Uh, 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 Ronald Moore involved here. There's no flab in this episode. There's nobody in this episode no. that doesn't have to be there. Yeah, there's no B story. No B story. Nothing there's like nothing like that. So right away, that already feels like, uh, you know, it's 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 something that maybe somebody came in from outside the writers' room, uh, you know, to 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 contribute the story of. But then they were able yeah. to work it into. Uh, you know, some of the drama at the time, uh, there is the callback immediately uh, to uh, Worf uh, and uh, you know, ha- not having uh, or, or Worf having a crisis of, of, of faith after having, uh, you know, met with the, 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 the Klingons that had been taken prisoner by Romulans. Uh, in birthright. In birthright. Right, right. So there's the callback to that. Uh, and uh, and then, of course, there's the callbacks to the Civil War. Uh, and there's, yeah. uh, there, we got Gowron there doing his thing. Uh, and, yeah, and right. so, you know, there's, uh, they, they managed to, you know, fit it in continuity wise really well. And, uh, and yeah. again, the story, and I don't know if I'm assuming everybody knows the story, but if, if they don't, the, the notion here is that they, um, you know, the, the clerics of the, the Boreth monastery, uh, uh, cloned, uh, Kalis. Uh, the unforgettable from from the, the you know back in the day fifteen hundred years earlier, uh, and right. they 
chose to have him present himself to uh, you know to Worf, who was there on a, a, a religious retreat uh, on this planet, and um, you know Worf first you know is doubtful, then he believes he's real, then he realizes he's not real, and then he has to be convinced that uh, no, he actually has a purpose, whether he's real or not. That might even be my favorite scene. Might it might even be right. in the whole series because. Uh, you have uh, in that last uh, you know, closing bit with Kalis speaking to Worf about Worf and his faith. Uh, you know, yeah, he's getting into something which is really kind of. Uh, uh, I thought at the time, wow, this is deep territory for a genre TV show. Um, yeah, because you know he he literally says, uh, and you can and immediately I thought, well, you could apply this to. Any religion on Earth, uh, yes, or, well, well, and, and it's clearly the allegory here that oh, yeah. all of the return stories, all of the resurrection stories, all of the you know whatever they are, you know, what if the actual event doesn't matter? You know, what if what if yeah. the rapture doesn't matter whether it happens or not? What if it? What if the thing that matters is just how you act? In your own, and that is the line in the in the in the episode. And I remember thinking at the time, "Wow, I mean, this is this is this is a show about you know normally you know phasers shooting at shields and things like that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no right, weapon yeah. is fired in this entire episode. Uh, the yeah. the only actual uh, there's there's no blood drawn." Uh, except whatever blood uh, was created. Well, there's some dried blood. Yeah, yeah. Whatever, <laughs> whatever, whatever blood was created, uh, used to create Kalos. Uh, you know, there's, there, there's, uh, there's some combat, but, uh, you know, the first combat is a Klingon for fun combat, uh, or at least that's right. what it turns into. And then, uh, and then later, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's stopped short. So, uh, again, uh, this is, uh, I thought it was pretty heady territory, uh, for the next generation to be in. And the only reason it works uh, is not just the writing, but it's because uh, you have uh, you have Michael Dorn really selling this thing. Uh, oh, yeah. You believe that he believes. And then you believe yeah. that he doesn't believe. Uh, and, <laughs> and, you know, you, you, you're able to read on his face. This is his episode, start to finish, uh, you're you're able mm. to read on his face, uh, you know, sort of the conflict that's there, uh, and you know they kind of have this nice touch of uh, Picard there at the beginning, allowing him to go forward on this journey, and yeah. then tying Data into it. I mean, it's hard to uh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, sometimes it's hard to remember that he has the pivotal role in the episode uh, because mm -hmm. he does say. Hey, you know what? Um, um, you know, I, I, uh, I myself had to decide whether I was just a robot, uh, and and maybe Kalos can be more than just a clone, uh, and so yeah, that is that is where that episode ends up going. Uh, you know, Worf convinces Galron that it makes sense to install Kalos as emperor, and very clearly. Uh, you know, sort of the the under, undercurrent of all of this is that the empire must still be a mess uh, following the civil war. Oh yeah, I think Galron's definitely having trouble. Um, and that and up. Galron is himself a piece of work anyway. So <laughs> yeah, I love Galron. Well, let me just sure. let me say real quick uh, that it, the episode is directed by uh, Winrich Kolb, who you mentioned Michael Dorn before or Worf before. Um, did enjoy working with. Michael Doran a lot, especially on this episode. Uh, the start date is four six eight five two point two. I was going to ask you to give me a synopsis, but yeah, you did. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so we sorry can move right that. on. No, that's fine. Um, there's some interesting facts from the memory banks here for the episode. Uh, we did mention that James E. Brooks, who, as you mentioned, sounds like a first time writer. He pitched the story originally as Jurassic Wharf, uh, presumably because of the use of you know agent DNA to revive someone. Um, Ron Moore added to that pitch. He expanded the show's examination of the beliefs of the Klingon Empire, and reportedly it led to a lot of discussion among the writing staff about their own beliefs. Uh, Brooks's original pitch didn't feature Kalis, uh, but I think Moore saw a chance to further, further develop that character, who originally appeared in the original series episode of The Savage Curtain, but in a very different way. 
Many of the details that make up Kalos' history and myths were developed for the earlier episode, Birthright, that you mentioned before, too. Um, the cool-looking Klingon temple on Boreth was inspired uh, by a Dan Curry, uh, artist for the production, created it, and he saw similar structures in the Himalayas, which I think pays off. And, of course, we were talking about Gauron. This is the last episode that he appears in TNG, and, of course, we won't find out how he tries to solve the problems of the Klingon Empire until later on in DS9. It's always a tricky in Star Trek, I think, to depict religion. Uh, Roddenberry was himself, depending on who you ask, either a secular humanist or a downright atheist. But something that he said specifically is that he reviles you know, false idols and people who would manipulate and deceive others for their own benefit. And that's something I can imagine coming out yeah. of Kirk's mouth. Um, and the show has depicted religion and spirituality in many forms from the Vulcan Katra to the depiction of Grey Thor and other Klingon elements. Um, Captain Picard celebrates Christmas, you know, for crap's sake. Of course, religion exists, uh, you know, in the show. The entirety of Deep Space Nine is, is directly tied to religion. My first question is, is Klingon religion really religion? Because to me, it seems more like hero worship. Oh, sure, there's legendary elements, but they know for a fact that this guy was real. I mean, they have their own version of the Spear of Destiny that's got his actual blood on it. Like, is this, you know, a mystical faith-based thing? Or is it just like, this guy died a long time ago, and we live in a time where, who knows, you know, people can come back in different ways. Like, is it, there's a spiritual element to it, but how much is it really a religion as we know it in the 21st century well uh the way that i looked at it and uh, this is the way that i developed it in in prey and again prey is this it prey sure. is the trilogy that that came out monthly here at the end of last fall and it seems to have done really well with with certainly with the readers one of the things with it is that Kalos is a through a, a, he he's a through line character he's he's in every book and there's a major you know, basically, this is the next chapter to his story, as far as I'm concerned. The right. way that I kind of looked at it uh, is that uh, Klingon religion, which really is, again, religion because the, the Klingons kill their gods. Um, exactly. Right. That's kind of what, what the my way point. that I looked at it was that Klingon uh, philosophy uh, was kind of the the equivalent of the Vulcan, and my mind is blanking on what 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 Spock went to uh, go take. Uh uh, Kulinar? Yeah, the, it's the equivalent of the Kulinar. It's the equivalent of uh, uh, Surak uh, giving the Vulcans, here is this thing that will calm your minds and stop your passions from destroying this civilization. That's yeah. exactly what this is. I, what it is, is it, it, it's just instead of being a meditative discipline, it's a physical discipline. It's it uses it, it substitutes uh, action and honor for uh, you know, inaction and contemplation uh, as yeah. these will be the things that will uh, calm the Klingon blood uh, and channel our anger so that we can go out and achieve uh, because otherwise we will destroy ourselves. I wrote a book called uh, Lost Tribe of the Sith for Star Wars, which was really a bunch mm -hmm. of Sith characters in a petri dish. Uh, they they were they were stranded on a planet, uh, you know, with no technology, and they had to survive generationally, uh, you know, for five thousand years. And so the big question was always, "Gosh, how do these people not kill each other?" And, right, and the way right. that they the way that they do it is they come up with a system that regulates ambition. Uh, and, and, <laughs> sure. and, and that, you know, they, they came up with a completely meritocratic system where they were all still crawling over each other to try to become, uh, you know, the most important person. Uh, but everything was, you know, rigidly set up with ritual and, um, you know, and, and everything like that. And that very mm. much equates to, uh, you know, the stuff that, uh, that, you know, Keith DeCandido was able to, yeah, you know, boil into uh, the uh, the Klingon art of war, which I I drew upon a lot uh, in the uh, in in the uh, in the prey books. Yeah, uh, you know, basic commandments like face your enemy, uh, don't don't strike from the dark, and all of that. Uh, and so, yeah, they 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 have these things that they believe, and I think that's why they believe them. And I think maybe that's yeah, that's that's the basis of many religions anyway. They're there. Yeah, it is. Yeah, they're to preserve the they're there to preserve the community against the baser instincts 
Yeah, it does. I mean, it seems like a like a. I mean, many religions are, but it seems like a belief of of emulation. It's it's like um, Bushido or, or or Buddhism. Although this Buddhism is more like you know, what's the sound of one neck snapping? But the <laughs> the legends surrounding Kalos do read a lot like Eastern uh, Eastern mythology. And I like the fact that you mentioned like the art of war. It's it's very Sun Tzu. Like if Sun Tzu was some sort of like religious figure or god. Uh, absolutely, I think that's the case, and uh, and so. Uh, yeah, I got to deal with all that in Prey, and I also got to deal with the, what I think are some of the contradictions in it. Uh, you know, one of the big things that I get into uh, because we 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 have we have our equivalent of the of the of the birthright group, except it's a much larger group of uh, Klingons who have been discommendated, uh, or okay. actually they're the descendants of the discommendated Klingons. So so they've really been rooked. They've they 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 uh, they they had no honor from birth. Uh, right. because of because of the rules uh, and and uh, you know one of the things that they ask in you know looking at their own culture is okay if face your enemy and not attacking for the shadows is such a big deal what's with all the cloaking devices uh, <laughs> right <laughs> what does all that mean and you know I, I got to kind of you know figure my way through that and uh, and and you know come up with a, a you know rationale for it uh, you know, they do announce themselves or they do that. You know, they do try to cloak before firing. Uh, you know, Chang is looked down upon because he he uh, you know, he fired while cloaked uh, besides the, all the other right. things that he did. Uh, but 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 also, you know, the way that I looked at it was uh, I had uh, spent a lot of time studying hunting cultures uh, at in part because in the very, very, very beginning uh, when I was proposing Prey, it wasn't going to be uh, the Klingons at all. It was going to be, uh, as, the, as this, this group of characters, uh, it was going to be a group of hunters. And the hunters were those characters from uh, that episode, uh, which I believe is called Prey, <laughs> or right. from, uh, from Deep Space Nine, uh, where, you know, they lived to hunt. And so one of the things that I realized just by studying them is that, well, uh, you know, where 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 hunters would uh, look upon, uh, you know, not wanting to face your enemy as as necessary uh, would be in terms of stalking, uh, in terms of creeping up on your prey. And then you show yourself and then you attack. Uh, But they would certainly use things like a hunting blind uh, to, uh, or camouflage, uh, to make their way there. Uh, and so, right. so I look for ways to try to finesse these things in, in, <laughs> in, uh, in Trek, uh, in, in the Klingon, uh, you know, mythos, uh, to sort of say, okay, here's why they think this is okay. And that is not. Uh, let's talk about the figure of Kalos, uh, played in this episode by Kevin Conway. Uh, he's an actor that people have probably seen him in something. I mean, he's been acting for a long time. Uh, fun fact, he actually took over from Vic Perrin, the voice of Control in the 90s revival of The Outer Limits. Oh, yeah. And he was also the voice of the sci-fi channel for a while. Yes, he was. Yeah. And you can really hear that when he talks in this episode. Uh, there's a lot of clear parallels in this story to the story of Christ. Um, and I think that's intended uh, from political leaders doubting him, being afraid of his possible political influence to, you know, Kalis has sort of a John the Baptist in the form of Koroth. Um, you know, Worf even kind of plays the role of doubting Thomas or perhaps Peter. It's so similar, in fact, that Rick Berman actually asked Ron Moore to tone it down a bit. <laughs> because he thought it, was, it was too on the nose. And there, there are a lot of figures like this in, in uh, sci-fi. It kind of reminds me of um, the Battlestar Galactica, the original series oh, yeah. uh, episode, uh, War of the Gods, where Count Iblis comes in and he's performing miracles for the Quorum of Twelve, and there's a real kind of who do you say I am vibe going on. And this episode, it stops short of them crucifying Kalis or him performing any miracles. Yeah. Well, and, and of course, you know, look to nothing, uh, if you want to look at, look at on-the-nose rules, religious stuff uh, the original Battlestar Galactica is right there oh my gosh oh yeah <laughs> the, yeah sure the, the 12 yeah. <laughs> the, tw- the 12 tribes and everything I mean the, the, yeah, well, this, yeah. is, this is kind of what I was saying is you know the the, the nuance uh, was not particularly uh, uh, very good uh, in you know TV science fiction you know before uh, a certain point and uh, right the fact that they you know I'm sure that they had to underplay some elements of this. I think one of the things that helped was that the humans are pretty much gone. Um, you have you have uh, Picard at the beginning. Uh, you yeah. you have Beverly showing up in the middle there somewhere. Uh, but you know, 
they don't do any, um, ah, well, this is like what happened with the followers on Earth back in the whatever. Yeah, nobody yeah, calls that out, exactly. That would uh, – Lampshades it, as they say on TV trips. Well, I mean that would be – that would, but see, they wouldn't have done it like that. It, would, it probably would have been done straight in a previous year uh, yeah. just to sort of say – this is what we are talking about, people. Uh, <laughs> right, this is yeah. what this is about, and and it would have been on the nose. And by making it purely a you know a Worf uh, and Kayla show, you know I think that that that, that worked. Uh, I think one of the interesting choices is in the casting. Uh, you know, Kayla is the shortest person in the room, uh, right. and it, you know, enough to the point where I I think I was you know, had I had to be reminded when I was doing the the story uh, for Prey. Right. Uh, that you know, we have him carrying a mechla instead of a batlet, uh, because okay. that's what they gave him. Uh, from what I'm told, uh, I, I can't tell one from another, <laughs> but but <laughs> supposedly what he, I think that what he has in the combat scene is shorter than your usual uh, batlet. Uh, okay. the, the, the the scene with Worf, uh, it's not oh. a full length one because again, he's uh, just a, his height. Uh, He's not a Michael Dorn. Yeah. yeah, and so, uh, but but you know they so you know he he doesn't look like um, well certainly not like the character from uh, from you know the original Star Trek, uh, but he also uh, you know doesn't have that sort of uh, you know necessarily what we would consider to be the radiant sun god look or something like that. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, of of somebody that you would set up to be. Uh, you know this otherworldly figure. He looks very earthy. Not maybe that's not the that's not the right word. He looks very real. He looks very much like somebody a Klingon would probably respect. Uh, and uh, you know it's just you know he he's not uh, you know he's he's not uh, you know, this muscular you know uh, uh, warrior. This is this is not Conan the Barbarian here. Yeah, uh, and right. and of course it shows when he loses uh, his his combat. Yeah. So. Yeah, uh, that's funny. That's interesting. And, but does he know what Warnog tastes like? That's the really important thing. Here. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's uh, there's a lot of Christ-like figures in sci-fi. And, of course, you know, you mentioned he doesn't seem to be what they think he's going to be, which, if I remember my Bible correctly, is, is uh, what they said about Christ as well. Um, and they're always used to, to comment or they're employed to comment on earthly religion. Um Previously, when we talked on the show about religion in the episode um, covering Who Mourns for Adonais, I mentioned the uh, Michael Moorcock novel, Behold the Man, which deals with something similar. What I like about this episode is that they – I think they avoid slipping into that blatant social commentary, um, Rick Berman's objections aside, by focusing on the Klingons and, like you said, leaving the humans out of it. And free of its religious trappings, I think it's a really good look at how a charismatic figure can really destabilize a society and sort of – Oh, uh, that's tear down, tear down the traditions, or or you know, uh, throw the money lenders out of the temple if well, you want. That's to that's the that's definitely the case that they're afraid of. Yeah. That they're afraid of that, uh, and I draw upon that in prey as well because I have a I have a cult and I have a charismatic figure in there, and I won't give away who sure. it is. But the people who have okay. read it, the people who read it, have read it, know who that character is and why that character would have been seen as as a charismatic figure. Um, yeah. No, as far as as far as the message. I think what's nice about the message is it is additive. It does not actually say, oh, by the way, your savior, whoever he is in whatever religion it is, is not coming back or was never real or is never this. But, you know, here's a way that we can interpret your religion so that it's okay for you and it's okay for me. Uh, Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's that 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 is not something that people do a lot of, Uh, you know, generally religions are exclusive as opposed to additive uh exactly yeah and and looking for ways where both can be true this is the thing that i'm doing all the time writing in tie-in fiction anyway is i'm dealing with <laughs> conflicting things in the canon and one of the things i always try to do is can i figure out a story way to make both accounts be true uh or acceptable okay. uh or you know m- both stories work because we want it to work <laughs> so yeah, right. Uh, right. And, and you know, it, and it's no mistake that, of course, the whole word "canon" comes in the beginning from religion. It, it is it, right. Exactly. It, it is <laughs> it is us looking at these things, and in fact, uh, you know, with with a with the eye of you know someone trying to interpret the words of another. Uh, and uh, in fact, one of my favorite lines about 
uh, you know, uh, comic book movies and, uh, and, you know, movies like Lord of the Rings, uh, from a film student friend of mine, uh, he said that, you know, we don't, we're not able to evaluate these movies as movies because we don't go to see them to see a movie. We go to see them to go to church. <laughs> I, I see. To, sure. To, to <laughs> hear the word of Tolkien, uh, translated by another preacher, uh, or, right. or watchman or whatever it is. Um, now that's that's what we're always doing. We're never actually saying, "Well, is this story working?" We're saying, yeah. "We're saying, hey, did that happen in the comic book?" And uh, you know, I think that gets us confused sometimes. This episode really focuses on well, clearly it focuses on Worf, and I really like how he is in this case somebody who is uh, doubtful, but it's merely to to test you know the 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 um the veracity of, of what's going on here like he is a believer he's willing to go to the monastery he prays for however long to see the vision but at the same time he's he's worried about the practical aspect of it like he wants to believe in a resurrected calus yeah. um but it's the principles like we said before that he embodied he wants those to return to klingon society it's not like he thinks that calus is going to come back on a cloud and smite the enemies and take them all to stovacor Instead, Kalis, in, in his mind, would be like the world's best motivational speaker yeah. for the Klingons. Like like if Tony Robbins was elected president and he had mad MMA skills, like he's going to turn things around for him. And, and that's, in fact, what he sets up. Uh, although, of course, again, right, the exactly. interesting thing, again, though, is that that you know, at the end, he's he's, you know, he's actually having done that. He feels worse. Uh, and, right. and, yeah. and that's that's what's that's what I think is makes this episode really leap beyond in addition to the themes and how they're handled uh, that yeah. Dorn uh, is a, a, a he is desperate to believe something he's desperate he's, he's you know, this is a guy who's he's setting a fire in his room <laughs> he's setting, he's setting his quarters he, he's setting his quarters on fire <laughs> he so much wants to uh, and and why right. the computer didn't tell anybody about that I don't, yeah, that's fine. I don't, <laughs> He's the security officer. He can turn that off. Probably. Uh, yeah, I, I did find it interesting that Riker goes down to the uh, uh, Riker goes down to his uh, his uh, his room with it with a you know, with a security team just because he's late. Uh, right, right. <laughs> Something's wrong. Yeah, I, right. <laughs> you know, maybe we need a line in there saying uh, there's a fire in the deck or something like that. Anyway, uh, but but yeah, I mean, <laughs> Worf, uh, you know, very much wants to believe, and I I guess I think it all comes from. Uh, yeah, you know, his abandonment. Uh, you know, the loss of his parents and and having, uh, you know, been raised uh away from the empire and you know having uh you know, had this this war to be accepted. Uh, yeah. you know, discommendation is a huge theme in uh in uh the prey trilogy. Uh, because again, I look at that and how I think that practice too can be at odds with what. Kalis would have wanted uh, based on his own things that he taught. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, Worf is, is, is sort of our person in the prey novels who's going along saying, uh, yeah, but here's the downside to this particular belief because I've, I've, I've lived it. Uh, but you know, clearly because he had just come through that, that, uh, that event very recently, uh, you know, just in the last, uh, this is season six. So, uh, yes. yeah, so I'm, you know, he's, he, he's undiscommendated. Uh, uh, and boy, that's a word that your spell check doesn't know. <laughs> sure. Uh, I found that out. Uh, it, you know, <laughs> that happens, I think the beginning season five. So he hasn't had a heck of a long time, uh, to, uh, you know, be a Klingon that other people wanted to look at. Uh, right. and, uh, literally, uh, because he he kind of was on this 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 uh, uh, he was this non person, um, yeah. you know I I think that he is probably at this point very disappointed by his culture uh, and what it did to him, uh, and he's trying to uh, get back on the horse and win it back, and that's where birthright comes in uh, because yeah. birthright uh, you know sort of teaches him uh, or gets him back on the path. But he's still he's still trying to get there, and this episode maybe brings him somewhat closer. Um, you know, I, I I do like to think that prey, uh, if not closes the circle, at least allows Worf to uh, become at become at peace or feel like he has done something 
to um, make discommendation better for other people who might not necessarily deserve it. Uh, because certainly his mm. son would not have deserved it. Do you and don't spoil your books here? Yeah. But I mean, there there is a um, there is a conspiracy going on here. I mean, Koroth and and who knows who else um, has done this for a reason at a certain time. Do you think they picked Worf for that reason because he has a foot in two worlds? Because he, I mean, he has a you know brother on the council and everything, but he is somebody who would be receptive to this. To use another sort of religious. Uh, parallel like he is the sort of Saul of Tarsus you know on the road here he's the guy that we can get and we can convert and he's in the right spot to really spread the word here. Uh, I think I think Worf uh, was uh, 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 you know what uh, as long as we're talking about TV tropes I, I, I think he was a fridge genius moment for them uh, okay, because sure. because I don't think that they intended for him to be the one um, if you do they intend for it to be the uh, the Doug Henning looking yeah, other yeah, guy because, <laughs> because the other guy is the guy I believe the other guy is the guy that had the vision uh, right. in front of the others and I think probably they were setting that character up uh, or you could read it as you know well if Worf hadn't been there this kid would have been their uh, their figure because he would have already had the moment where he saw Kalos and now here he has the moment where he sees Kalos and he shows up and the kid already has credibility with the other monks who are not in on it uh, because, because he's, they've seen him do this. Uh, And I think, I think Worf was kind of a a bonus because they would have had no notion that he was going to come there. Uh, They, well, it took took him 12 days to get there. Well, they would have some time to get ready. Well, that that's, that's (laughs) true. And being able to go away for that long and, you know, sitting in a shuttle for 12 days can't be fun. Uh, Right. But, uh, and, and, and we wonder how many Starfleet officers get to go away that long on retreat. Uh, That just doesn't, yeah, uh, probably, probably, probably not too many. And with a shuttle to boot. Uh, but I, I guess, uh, you know, Picard owes, uh, owes, uh, owes Worf some stuff, uh, by this sure. point. Uh, yeah, I think that, I think that, uh, no, nah, they, they just story logic wise, um, they might've been looking for their Patsy at this point. Uh, but I, I don't necessarily think, uh, it, you know, since just mere exposure to Kalis, uh, caused those two, uh, foot soldiers of Galron to uh, you know bend their knees. Uh, they probably didn't need Worf. They, pro- yeah. they probably would have. They probably would have taken anybody. But they probably might have thought, well, hey, Worf's a hero. Let's yeah. you, you, sure let him do it. Uh, yeah, although if you know if Worf kills him in in that first challenge they have, then the game's up. And they certainly look worried about that, don't they? Yeah, right. Uh, they right. they do. Uh, they're they're. I think their thinking is if they can sell uh, Worf, uh, you know, then then they probably are going to be good to sell other people. And this is what's fun in Prey. Again, not to give it away, you will find that there is a charismatic leader who Worf has to decide if he believes who that person is, and it's the same moment. And it's the same reason that they that okay. it's, the, it's, it's the same reason I've just said but that getting you know testing testing yourself out on Worf is really you know that that is <laughs> yeah. that will that will that will tell you you have made the sale uh, and, and yeah. so that is that is a moment from this series that you know, is uh, is reflected in Prey uh, and also the moment with uh, with Picard being willing to entertain. Worf's uh, religious uh, struggles as something real and physical and manifest and meaningful. I have yeah. a beat like that, uh, you know, in the first prey book as well. In fact, it ends on it. So, um, okay. yeah, that I, 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 I really cannot uh, you know, underline enough uh, the extent to which, uh, you know, this episode informed this trilogy uh, and, and of course, the fact that you know Kalis is is everywhere, uh, you know, particularly uh, you know, a, a, as you read the book. I mean, I, 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 as you read the first book, you'll 
you'll you'll probably have more Kalos lines there than you had in this entire episode. So <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, you mentioned uh, Data and Worf's connection before, and I, I like the fact that Worf gets his kind of aha moment from Data at the end of the episode. Worf and Data is a pairing that we don't get very often. Like Data is fixated on being more human. And, uh, of course, he doesn't drink and fight, so there's no traction for Worf there. But I always thought that their connection should be explored more. Like, Data should find Klingon culture just as fascinating as human culture, you'd think. And Data can't get a rush out of combat, but Worf can really acknowledge that Data would be a pretty good sparring partner. See, I, so I was, I wanted to see more of them together. I would think so, too. And, uh, you know, I, I think uh, again, the vibe that we get here in this episode is Worf is pretty much saying, I am not going to be your guru. I, I am not going to be your, you know, I'm not your, I'm not your Sherpa to help you up this mountain. Uh, don't ask me because I, I'm still trying to figure it out myself. Uh, yeah. Worf, of course, is trying to figure out what it means to be Klingon at the same time that, uh, that yeah. Data is trying to figure out what it means to be alive. Uh, so, yeah. uh, or sentient. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I think, yeah, you're right. It, there should have been more episodes where he was, uh, you know, trying to, uh, he, he, ne- he never, he never, he never tries on a different, uh, di- different, uh, headpiece or anything like that until the one, right. until the one time he pretends to be Vulcan. Uh, you know, it's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. you would think, you would think he would be able to do that. I mean, you know, just, sure. just, uh, uh, what, what was the character in, uh, in, in six million dollar man Maskatron, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, where he, he, you, you wow. can be anybody you wanted. Well, you know, if we're going to go back to the Star Trek cartoons, well, we're doing 70 seconds. If we're going sure, to so. do the Star Trek cartoon <laughs> series, I can definitely go back to, uh, to Maskatron. Right. So, yeah. yeah, we can just stick a little Bondo on his ears there and he can be a Vulcan or whatever. Yeah. yeah and yeah, he, sure. you never see him try to do that. But I think the reason you never see him try to do that is he's pretty sure that it would be considered disrespectful. Uh, that's and true. and no no human thinks it's disrespectful. Uh, he doesn't want to appropriate. Yeah, right. uh, but I, I mean, I guess the thought would be, you know, what uh, what do they call it? The uncanny valley is the is is <laughs> is the split between you know how human something looks and what a human actually looks like. Uh, it, yeah, I'm right. guessing it's probably a lot bigger for an android pretending to be a, a Klingon and and then a Klingon. Uh, again, yeah. <laughs> uh, impersonation, uh, which of course is a part of this episode, impersonation is again a huge theme in Prey. It, it happens not just you know, in in the couple of you know, obvious times, but if you go looking through it, there's like eleven, twelve different <laughs> moments <laughs> where there are different kinds of impersonation going on, and uh, okay, and so uh, it, it's it's uh, and that really speaks to what I do. Uh, in a lot of my, in <laughs> sure. a lot of my other work, yeah. Knights of the Old Republic was all about con artists. Uh, oh, yeah, and yeah. so, uh, in, in my series anyway, so, uh, it, it was all about confidence games. Uh, and you know, one of the long through line plots of the Knights of the Old Republic comic series that ran for about, uh, you know, three or four years was, uh, you know, a, a really long game con that had lasted for about 30 years. Um, you know, and, and likewise, uh, uh, there was another character that I had be a traitor in the cast who hid for about four years, uh, and, and then, and then shows himself, uh, in the last storyline. Uh, you know, that is kind of what Kalis in, in this episode is, is being set up to do. Um, yeah. here's the yeah. question. When does he realize he's not Kalis? That's a good question. There is that big moment where they sort of all uh, go to, uh, to the quarters or whatever, and then Worf's mad, and and the priests are still trying to cover up. They're kind of like, "Oh, well, he just, you know, he's tired," yeah. or you know, normally he would have totally killed that guy. Uh, but uh, how soon would he have figured it out? This is like this is like day nine of his life. That's true. Yeah. Uh, I, I did. I did like the idea. Um, they don't get too much into the sort of cosmology or, or the mechanics of this, but I did like how when Worf's like, "Well, like, what do you know?" and he's like, "Well, I'm I'm kind of incarnated now. Like, maybe I was a god before, but while I'm here, I only have kind of what I have, so I don't necessarily remember all these little things." Like, I like that idea. Like, if you, it's like a Norse myth or, th- or something like that. If like Worf or Worf, <laughs> if Thor or, or Odin or something like that came down to speak with men, maybe they would somehow yeah. be lesser. Than they would be, you know, in Valhalla. Well, I mean, you know, they've they. That's the only way you can probably make it work, or say, you know, just tell it to Kalos so it would work. Uh, right. And they had to have. 
they had to have set him up with that line beforehand the same way they set him up with every other line. They're not so they're right. not so dumb they couldn't have thought of this. Sure, uh, right, yeah. After yeah. <laughs> after planning this all this time, uh you know, they they the thing though is that they probably did not have um, you know, really, uh, uh, yeah. the Klingons are not Romulans. That's another, that's another line from, from Prey. Uh, they're not real good at this. Uh, the, the whole brainwashing thing, uh, sure. and the whole creating a deep agent. Uh, and so it was bound to blow apart, uh, at some point under some questioning or even Kalis's own questioning. Again, Prey does does you know, deal with that directly as well. And if you like this episode, uh, you and and any listeners out there, uh, go get these three books. Uh, they the they're now the the audio books have just uh, begun releasing, uh, and it's been a lot of fun hearing Kalis again through the voice of uh, Robert Petkoff. Yeah, that's a good point about Klingons and Worf, who, no matter his foibles or his background, is pretty much the ultimate Klingon at this point. I like the fact that his solution is we're going to tell everybody everything. Oh, that's the only way. And my thing is, Let's... well, my, and my thing is, like, are the Klingons going to accept this guy? Because it's here's your bumpy headed Jesus. Uh, he's come to make everything better. He was grown in a tube like fungus. But d- don't worry about that thing. Uh, you know, you could figure out how they would do it. Uh, you know, they they, uh, they, they there's uh, I, I can. You know, look, if the if the priests could come up with a story <laughs> that would <laughs> that would make this thing work one way, uh, you can probably dress the truth up in such a way uh, that that it would be accepted. And again, the way to do it uh, is uh, and, and again, I, I get to deal with this in the books. Uh, the way the way to do it is uh, to have him uh, be uh, an intermediary and interlocutor. He, he isn't. He he doesn't pretend to be Kalos, uh, the original. Uh-huh. What he simply is is look, I'm a walking Bible. Um, I'm I'm yeah. you know if 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 you will accept uh, preachers uh, in another religion who you know what well what does anybody in a seminary do? They 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 try to become an embodiment of the word in terms yeah. of being able to. Uh, pass the word through them and then also interpret it and make it relevant to people's lives in the now. Uh, yeah. And uh, where I go further uh, in Prey uh, is, you know, we say that he was playing that role all along up until in the stories. Now, now what happened was that there was, there was a, there was a novel called Kalis that, that, uh, that Friedman did, which was a Kalis adventure that sort of implied that he wasn't even really the real Kalos's uh, uh, clone. Uh, that that came out in the nineties, uh, mm-hmm. and and uh, then they did a number of you know minor appearances, and then they sent him into retirement, uh, where he said, you know, now that Martok is in charge, uh, the 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 Empire has found honor again, uh, and uh, Kalos literally goes off to a Federation garden planet to paint pretty pictures. <laughs> that's that's okay. what he does to find himself. Uh, right. I bring him out of retirement, uh, and <laughs> and you know we we begin what I what I what I look at him as, and this again getting into religion and the Jedi uh, is I, I begin to have him realize that his function is not simply to uh, parrot the words of of Kalos, uh, but uh, you know what. I, I don't have a lot of favorite moments in uh, the the uh, the Attack of the Clones movie. Uh, I think you know, maybe a lot of people don't have a lot of favorite moments in there. But my favorite moment, in fact, in the entire uh, the entire uh, prequel trilogy, probably, is when Obi Wan Kenobi, and of course I've, I've written a lot of, with about Obi Wan. Uh, Obi Wan sure. conf- uh, is confronted by uh, you know that that uh, that John Cryer looking alien that is is in the bar who says <laughs> you want to buy some death sticks and he says right. you don't want to buy you don't want to sell me death sticks you want to go home and think about your life right <laughs> now here's the thing that's a one off moment it's a beat. It's a joke. There's not enough jokes in the prequel trilogy. <laughs> Go home, Ducky. Go home, yeah. Ducky. Yes, exactly. There, there's, <laughs> there's, there's not enough of that in the prequel trilogy. So that was welcome right there already. But 
it's extremely important. In fact, I've written about this in Star Wars magazine. The reason it's so important is it shows the Jedi doing what they're supposed to do. <laughs> yeah. Besides fight <laughs> Sith. Yeah, right. Besides be the free the freebie police force that the, the Republic gets. They're supposed yeah. to minister. They're supposed to actually be sort of the circuit riders, so to speak, uh, for the force. Uh, right. And, you know, it must have happened. Uh, and, and the folks at Lucasfilm know it must have happened, because why else do you get the character in Rogue One who is not a Jedi but believes? But he's literally, yeah, right, exactly. You know, why, yeah. you know, why, why would you have that? So, um, you know, obviously... The Jedi feel that the, the 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 light side of the of the Force is enhanced by telling people to do good, uh, or by solving conflicts, uh, and yeah. and uh, you know peace, peace is you know the word peace is literally in uh, in their mantra that uh, that was created for them for the role playing game. Well, yeah. I, I think that that is kind of what uh, and again not to give too much away, but. Yeah, that's what Kalos, I think, needs to uh, discover is uh, he's got to be uh, he's he's not there to lead the Empire. Uh, He's not there necessarily to just be a scold and say uh, you're you're not (laughs) acting right or anything like that. Uh, He's he's, he's got to kind of show them uh, and show them in a non-threatening way that is not uh, going to make the chancellor feel imperiled. Uh, right, what, right. what he needs to do is go counsel the weakest. Uh, and in this case, Worf was one of the weakest because his faith was failing. Yeah. At this point, that's true. Yeah. I really appreciate getting to talk about this. I had gotten a, uh, I, I did a star, a star Trek dot com blog post about Kalis and the question of who he was and why that was central to, uh, to my trilogy. But really, I think it, it is, it is, uh, you know, one of the, one of the, I think major, uh, themes in the book, and in it, it does come from this episode. So I'm I'm happy to be able to talk about it. You mentioned humor and levity before. Um, this episode isn't a barrel of laughs, but there are a few good moments. Um, I really like the uh, part where Gauron is confronting Kalis, and Kalis is uh, Gauron is sort of playing the Pharisee of sorts, yeah. and Kalis is telling him the parable of the guy that spit into the wind or whatever, and Gauron's like, "What color were his eyes?" and that's that's the don't ask the almighty for his ID moment like that's yeah. Jesus is, is telling the parable of the virgins. And if you're Thomas, you don't say like, yeah, but were the virgins hot? Like, you don't you don't, don't challenge your religious figure. But, uh, but Star Trek has already gone here. What does God need with a starship? That's uh, that's that's one of the funny beats uh, that uh, in that movie. But uh, but of course, you know, they, they were doing that all the time, questioning, uh, uh, questioning the would be deities back in the original series. Yeah. I also like that, you know, Robert O'Reilly as Gowron gets to del- deliver that line. And of course, he's very famous for his eyes. And I feel like he kind of bugs him out a little when he asks that, too. Like, his eyes. I don't know how they do that. I mean, that, the, 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 the eyes going that way and just some of the makeup because they, you know, they were the, – the, 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 they're in extreme close-up in so many shots in this episode – yeah, it looks great. Uh, and 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 you know the uh, you know the remastered uh, you know episodes uh, you know for because again I I watched this again on uh, on Netflix. Sure. Uh, you know it's it's I, I was catching a lot of little you know, nuance that uh, I didn't see before. And I I also really like that moment with Kalos in the tricorder where he's he doesn't immediately go to you are doubting me you you scum he's like yeah okay go ahead <laughs> sure yeah. That's the touch, touch the holes in my hands. Uh, moment yeah, there. yeah. I mean, because yeah. he doesn't doubt. Uh, not yet. It'll be a few days. Right. Right. Well, as we uh, wrap up here, do you have any uh, last thoughts? Any parting shots about this episode? Uh, just that. Yeah. As I said, I, I think it is. It it it's a great episode. I think it is. It, it is certainly the best Klingon episode uh, uh, of of well, I would say almost any of the any of the series in terms of just Klingon centric. Uh, you know the, the culture and everything else. Uh, mm. Maybe you know just nudging a, a bit ahead of uh, of uh, sins of the father uh, in mm. terms of uh, on uh, because it's a complete story. It's a beginning, yeah. a middle, and an ending. Uh, but it is also the kind of story that you can only tell in season six. Uh, that you can only do uh, you know because. Uh, you know, you've built up Worf as uh, a sympathetic character who we really care about uh, his spiritual uh, situation. 
Uh, yeah. And it only works because we have established what the civil situation is in Klingon society to this point. Um, mm. You know, the only flaw, uh, if if there is one, I would say, uh, of being a bottle episode uh, is that you don't see you know, th- this doesn't take place um, you know, on, uh, you know, th- they don't go to Kronos for this. Uh, yeah, right. Or they don't even beam down. They don't even beam down to Boreth, uh, you know, a plant that presumably has Klingons living on it. Uh, to have uh, to have their uh, you know their scenes they're done on the holodeck, uh, uh, yeah right you yeah. know and <laughs> because they, that that if, if they did that and they actually had a little if you had more money uh, and and you had you and you had the time you would have had that final uh, you know that that scene where uh, you know Galron is confronting Kalos you would have had it in a in a uh, a public setting uh, on Boreth where Lots of people have come there, and yeah. you would be able to show lots of people still hang around outside. That way, it wasn't just the two guys. Uh, yeah. That might be you know, what what we needed to convince Gowron a little better. Uh, would be if Gowron actually gets to confront. Oh wow! You mean there are people keeping vigil outside? Uh, you know, just dozens of them, and we see them. Uh, yeah. You know that. That uh, and we've seen moments like that in other shows, uh, but I think that's kind of what you would have to have uh, to yeah. to improve upon it. But uh, all that said, uh, you know, within the within the within the um, within li- the limits that they were dealing with here, uh, you know, a very strong episode, and you know, certainly it's one that spoke to me, and I was able to to draw upon in prey. Yeah, I, I I really enjoy it too. I still regret a little bit that there's no sort of side or, or B story. Um, but I think that it really proves, and it should, because you know Ronald Moore is at the wheel here. That the show is committed to the Klingons as an important part of the new series going on, and it's cool to see them have their own crisis of faith. I think that's true, and you know, for for people who want to get really really meta, uh, you know, my 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 series Prey, you know, Prey is a homophone. It's Prey P R E Y because I've got the hunters and I've got uh, <laughs> uh, very and clever. then and, and well, there 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 are actually lots of word games hidden in the chapter titles and everything else like that as well because we we have a lot of magicians in our book too. Uh, so uh, ah. oh yeah, oh yeah, we the that that's one of the other elements is I deal with the the theme of illusionists in Star Trek and there are certainly a lot of those. Uh, but sure. but yes, uh, you know, you've got Prey one way and you've got Prey the other way, and of course I'm glad that people were able to read the book because when we were writing it uh, or when i was writing it that you know our joke in the house here was uh star trek pray that it's on time uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh well speaking of a new series and speaking of the klingons are you looking forward to discovery i, I am and you know i'm trying to stay away from some of these spoilers that are out there because uh, i want yeah. to you know, be you know have have the have my uh uh expectations uh fouled up by you know, they, they, they yeah, are those really Klingons that we're seeing in the in that <laughs> in that screen cap or not? Uh, right. You know, I don't know. Uh, I I tend to try to avoid spoiling anything for myself that I don't need to know about uh, for for writing something. So, uh, yeah, excited to see it. I'll, I'll be interested. Uh, you know, I'm I'm delighted that they're keeping within the original CBS continuity. Uh, yeah. And uh, you know, that's, I think, very important. And, um, you know, it it means that it all still matters. And, you know, honestly, if there had been a way to do it in Star Wars, uh, I know they would have done it. Uh, it's just, you know, st- you know Star Wars, uh, the, the problem was all the good moments had really been used up uh, in terms of what happens to Han and Luke and Leia after they grow up. Let's talk my space dad can beat up your space dad. Who's your favorite captain and why? Oh wow, favorite captain. Well, I, I've written I've written Picard the most. Uh, so, yeah, certainly he's got. Uh, the most layers to him, uh, and and he's a lot of a lot of fun. I've been needing needing to go back and do a deep dive again into uh, into uh, Deep Space Nine. Uh, you know, I saw them when they were out, but uh, you know, it's been it's been a long time since. And certainly, yeah, you know, that's one where you kind of need to watch them in order. Uh, yeah, you do. I, yeah. I'm seeing Voyager again now for the first time since it was out. Now that BBC is running it, uh, BBC America. Uh, and and those are, are are fun. And I'm I'm uh, since Tuvok is one of the major characters in Prey. Uh, uh, you know that that's you know that's uh, you know that's 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 kind of fun to see as well. 
so uh, so yeah, I, I I guess I would suppose. Well, you know, Riker's a captain. Does Riker count? Uh, Possibly. Oh yeah, sure, well, no, yes. Riker. You know, my first novel was uh, well, my the Titan was yeah. well, my, well, was, uh, my first novella was Titan, and then my first novel was Takedown. Uh, which uh-huh. is a Riker story, uh, front front uh-huh. to back. So uh, you know it's, yeah. uh, that that would be that would be where I would probably go on that one. Now that we've reached the end of the show, you'll receive a commission at the rank of ensign. What department on the ship do you work in? Oh wow, uh, <laughs> uh, I I would probably be uh, an archivist because uh, <laughs> uh, twentieth century Russian uh, well, studies, <laughs> or you know, or comic book circulation history, or something oh, like sure. that. Sure, there you go. Uh, yeah. yeah, I you know the 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 sort of person person where you know uh yeah that's that's on memory alpha but you're just looking in the wrong place uh <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah I, I i'm guessing uh, anything that that means i will not get called down to the surface that would make me happy i see uh, sure, and so sure. th- that would that would probably be my role uh they never bring the archivist with the with the away team Right. Uh, digital comics have to look pretty good on a pad, I'd imagine. Well, yeah. I, I, and digital comics didn't look good at all until we got the pad, uh, the, the iPad. Right. Uh, that's, <laughs> yeah. uh, that's, uh, that, I think that's, that's kind of humorous as well. Uh, although, although I will say, and again, this is, this is with my comic book history hat on, the, the week that the iPad was released and suddenly made digital comics worth reading, uh, the number one comic book in America – is a book that still can't be reproduced worth a darn on an iPad uh, or a tablet. Uh, that was the final issue of DC's Blackest Night, which was the Green Lantern uh, storyline, which had a double gatefold interior center spread. So <laughs> okay. it actually goes out, and it's this giant, you know, eight not eight foot, but it's 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 like it's like you, you got you got a you got an image that's four feet across. Uh, right, right. You still can't do that. So, right. <laughs> so you know, paper is still important, and 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 we we still got it. Ensign Miller, thanks for joining me to talk about Star Trek and the Star Trek universe. If people want to continue the conversation, and they can at at EIST Pod on Twitter and the Enterprising Individuals Facebook page. Where can people find you online? Uh, they can find me on my uh, my comics and fiction website uh, at uh, farawaypress dot com. I have essays, behind the scene essays on all the books that I've ever done. Uh, with the exception of Prey, which I still have to get around to putting up. Uh, <laughs> I also am on Twitter, JJM Faraway, uh, and I am on uh, Facebook at uh, John Jackson Miller. Uh, people can also follow my uh, comics uh, history website I mentioned. That's Comicron.com, C-O-M-I-C-H-R-O-N, uh, short for Comics Chronicles. Okay, thanks again for joining me. All right, very good. I, I really had a ball here. Me too. We're signing off until the next mission. Hailing frequencies closed. I'm your